Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And did you know that there are people having their own connections with loved ones in the afterlife without mediums? You may remember in episode 157, Craig Hogan, the president of the Afterlife Research and Education Institute, spoke very highly about this amazing woman and her grief protocol that is 98% effective. Her name is Rochelle Wright, and she is a licensed mental health counselor, licensed chemical dependency professional, national certified counselor, EMDR certified therapist and designer of the repair and reattachment grief therapy method. She has been a grief and trauma psychotherapist for 26 years. Her focus is training licensed psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, marriage and family therapists, and mental health health counselors in this highly effective out of the box method. She also schedules the grief sessions with individuals. Rochelle is the co-author with Craig Hogan of two books, Repair and Reattachment Grief Therapy and Guided Afterlife Connections. Her website is RochelleWright.com. So Rochelle Wright, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Well, thank you very much, Sandra, and thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure, and it's really great to know about your work and to be, get to share it, because this is big news. Well, it's, thank you, and it is different because um, it's very different what I do and what I train therapists to do than, you know, being a medium because it they actually get the information from the other side directly. I don't get it and, and tell them about it. They tell me, and I write it down. So they're getting it directly, Sandra, which is, it's very different. Oh, it's very different. Could you tell us just a little bit um, how you got your start into the world of discovering the afterlife, you know, connected to this, or was it something that just naturally happened when you were working with people with grief? Well, actually, both. Okay, yes, both. okay. Uh, the first is, uh, I think about 15 years ago, I started dreaming uh, about deceased people. And also, I would get all sorts of other things in my dream, dreams um, about peace and things like that, things that I wouldn't even be thinking about. Um, I was involved, uh, I have been involved in um, The Course in Miracles for many, many years, probably 25, at least 25 years, and and, uh, involved in the Eckhart Tolle uh, readings and that sort of thing. So, Mm -hmm. but anyway... These um, deceased people started coming to me in dreams, like almost every night, Sandra. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. And then someone would make a cameo appearance, and some would come and stay longer, and they would have things to say. And um, I was working in full time, and uh, I remember that I went to work one day and said to my secretary, I said, you know, she knew this was going on, and I said you know, this has got to stop because it's it's interfering with my day job. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. And and as soon as I said that, it stopped, Sandra. Oh. I, I, yes, it stopped. And I had, I had said to Craig Hogan, I told him about it, and he said, well, isn't it interesting how they listen? <laughs> and I said, yes, it is. But what is very interesting is they came in, This came in through like the back door then because I'm doing therapy and uh, uh, I remember, you know, things did happen in my office that were kind of out of the ordinary and I've always been thinking, you know, in this vein about um, just different, how different things happen or they'll come to me and they'll... They'll just really help me. But anyway, um, I'm in my office, and I had a. I was actually seeing a social worker, and um, she had lost her brother, and she was came in one day and told me that he was only 27, and he left a, a wife and a, a child, and she was just distraught because her whole family was looking to her to help them. 
Mm. And she herself was not in a place to help them. So I, I said, well, you know, let's, let's try something. And I thought, because I, I have them use a headset, which is very different. They listen to bilateral stimulation, which um, goes from the right to the left brain. And what it does, it brings up things that normally wouldn't come up or they wouldn't maybe think of. Mm-hmm. But she had that going because all my clients listen to that in the office. Headphones on, and, I'm imagining. Yeah. Okay. And so I told her, I sat back in my chair stand and I said, okay, we'll just um, go inside and just bring up your brother. And, uh, you know, I kind of I set the scene, like bring up your brother and, you know, and and uh, kind of some things that she had repeated to me about the hymn. And uh, I sat back and I said, something, help me, please help me. Because I didn't know. I didn't mm-hmm. think anything was going to happen. Anyway, she started talking to her brother. And she started talking and talking, and I'm like sitting there dumbfounded. And one of the things I have learned very quickly after that is, you don't say what I said, but I, uh, she started talking to her grandfather, too. And so I said, oh, is your grandfather deceased? <laughs> and cause I was so shocked. And she said, yes. In other words, leave us alone. Mm-hmm. We are busy. We're having conversation. You know, and so I learned very quickly, you don't do that. But she went, they went on and on for about 15 minutes. And he told her a lot of things about his daughter, not to worry about her, that she was being taken care of, and that uh, he was fine, and she, I can't remember, I have it in the file, but all of that. And um, then at the end, she said, now my, grand, my grandfather and my brother, they're swirling in a circle of um, gray. Their heads are going around it, and now it's getting a little bit darker gray, and now it's getting black. And now they're gone. Hmm. So that was um, that was the first experience that I had like that. And, of course, I was very excited. How was she and, left, the client there? How did she feel? Well, she left feeling much better. I would think so. Yes, much better. And um, so I started, um, actually started... Uh, doing some of the work with my regular clients and I um, I had a, a connection with Craig Hogan and so I kept telling him what I was getting and so forth and he says let's write a book we've got to write a book about it and he said I don't know Rochelle if it's just that you will be able to do it or I don't know that you can teach it to other therapists and I said yes I can I know I can mm. and um so that's how it happened, Sandra. Well, that's incredible. And did she describe this experience, I mean, like it was just very real? I mean, different than just a dream or her? Because I've done some meditations that I've conjured up somebody sitting on a park bench with me, and I'm not convinced they actually were. Or it's just my imagination. Right. She was really in this, and she did not want me to interfere with it. I mean, she just was like disgusted when I said, is your grandpa deceased? I mean, she was like, why are you interfering with this? You know, so, um, no, it was very real for her. Mm-hmm. And um, I have um, file after file of now with the protocol that I, I do and that I teach of people and their experiences. And it's just, um, it's really a look into the afterlife and this other dimension it's, I feel like it's really a privilege, but I remember at first when, um, you know, Craig was going to write the book and, or we were going to write it. It was my content, but he was the writer. This is Guided Afterlife Connections, that book. Yes, that right? was the first yeah. one. Okay. And he, um, I remember walking to my back door, Sandra, and thinking, why is this happening to me? And so I said to Craig in a conversation after that, why, I mean, why is this happening to me? You know, I felt all of a sudden very responsible, Sandra. Mm -hmm. 
because I'm a responsible person, and I'm thinking, what is this, what is this going to mean in my life? And he said to me, when I asked him, he said, why not you? Exactly. He said, you have been chosen to, to carry this on. You've been chosen to bring it forward, Rochelle. And you so, have such um, good credentials for being someone, you know, it, it, it's still kind of the time that sometimes when we speak about mediums or connecting with the dead, we have these, uh, these thoughts of talking to these kind of woo-woo, new-agey type people. And you are a mainstreamed uh, mental health counselor. And I mean, there's so much that you have as credibility that I personally, if I was going to give someone this mission, I'd give it to you. Well, thank you very, you know, thank you very much uh, for saying that. And, uh, you know, normally uh, it's really not accepted that, um, that therapists do this kind of work, or t- at least if they do, they talk, they don't talk about the afterlife and right. so forth. So, so what happened, Sandra? I really, you know, stepped out of the box, and um, I never ever felt like I was going anything was going to um, anyone was going to question me or anything. Really, um, I just felt that's what I needed to do, and uh, it, it felt like a really good thing to do. So, but normally, um, you know, they don't. Um, so one of the things that we did was, um, we did change the book, some revi- revised it mm-hmm. and changed the name to repair and reattachment grief therapy. Uh, because I feel like it's more palatable to, um, to therapists when they want to, you know, be trained. And it's also a, more palatable to the general public. Oh, and, so it's yes, the well, same information <laughs> within the... I, I have on yes, my shelf Guided life, yes. Afterlife Connections, the first version. Right. Okay. Exactly. And what happened, Sandra, with that is I had a dream about... I have to think maybe it's two years ago now. Well, whenever we changed, we revised it and changed the name. But... I had a dream, and um, I had this mentor who was a psychologist, and she's a nurse, and um, very well known, uh, actually in the in the field. Um, I don't know. I will say it in the EMDR field um, at that time, and she was my mentor years ago, since since two thousand, and. She came to me in a dream, and she's retired now, and I haven't spoken with her. And she came to me this dream, and she, I saw her walking down a hill, and on the right side there were other people and so forth. And I thought to myself, Sandra, oh, my gosh, I wonder if she knows what I'm doing and what is she thinking about it, mm-hmm. <laughs> what I thought. And in the dream, I actually recall, I just started backing up, like, you know, I back up your head, like, oh, my gosh, what is she going <laughs> to say? <laughs> what is she going to say? And she stopped, and she, I said, do you know what I'm doing? And she said, yes, it's called repair and attachment therapy. And I said, oh, repair and reattachment therapy. Wow. That was the end of it. And so... That was the end of the dream. And I thought about it for a couple of weeks, and I thought, this is what is supposed to happen. Mm-hmm. Have you ever spoken to that woman, uh, or was it just in the dream state? Oh, I actually state? haven't. Uh, I actually haven't. It doesn't um, matter, because she got to you, and it's pretty cool. No, she, yeah, she got to me and told me that it was... and. Um, She's so credible. I mean, that is the thing. She's so credible, or, you know, was at that time in the field. She's retired now. Mm -hmm. Uh, So well thought of. Wow. Um, It just shows how powerful we are, because even just thinking that you can connect with a deceased person this way, that we are powerful souls, and and why not have somebody who's alive visit us in the dream state? Why not? Oh, yes. And, uh, yes. They do, and actually, um, I be, you know, I had the experience myself of um, someone who was actually sick and diagnosed in, I think, February 
of cancer and didn't pass till the following January 1st and um, came to me and said a lot of things to me in the dreams. I think, you know, it just gave me a lot of peace about it. And um, how much do I want to say? I might as well say it. Say it. <laughs> it was my husband. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I hadn't been married to him for like um, 20 years or something. But he came to me and he said, um, I need to talk to you for a half hour. And I'm like, I'm really busy right now. I don't know that I have the time. And he said, um, I just need a half hour. And I said, well, okay, I'll take a half hour. I can take a half hour. Because it was kind of like I'm busy doing what I'm doing now, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and so we we left, and he said, this is when he's still alive, you know? Mm-hmm. He didn't pass till January 1st. And he said, I'm so sorry. What happened? And I want to make it up to you. <laughs> wow. I was like, Wow, and I thought in the dream to myself, I thought, um, well, I don't know how I'm going to fit him in now because I'm so busy. (laughs) This is really nice. So, you know, so the dreams have really helped me um, with all this, too. And uh, I think the dreams, if we're open, we just need to be open and um, allow what, can come to us to come to us because it will it's just like when we're closed we're much more dense and when we're open we're lighter and that will you know i think that's what what helps a lot sandra Mm -hmm. and i think too when we hear stories that other people are doing this it's like we're having these kind of dreams it's like well you know i'm a person too why not me and so somehow our minds are open to it um, but I want to ask you, Rochelle, are these dreams ones that you can, like, clearly remember, or are they kind of fuzzy? You know, I've heard stories. So the ones that you remember mm-hmm. are the ones you're supposed to remember. Okay. They really come to you, and, you know, they're not fuzzy. Yes. You remember them in the morning. That's the they're answer. Very, they're was, very real. That was the answer I was looking for. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I'm glad I know to hear we're, it. We're kind of talking about dreams now, but that's one of the things I really like too. I used to do a lot of dream therapy, mm-hmm. you know, with clients. So um, it, it is very interesting. And I think, again, answering you, uh, it, it will, you will remember the dream. If they're fuzzy, they're not that quite that important. Mm-hmm. That's what I would say. Yeah, I know many people have had dreams of their loved ones who have passed on, and they're clear, they remember them, whereas so many dreams, you wake up in the morning and you knew there was a happy or crazy dream, but you don't remember. So that's just one of the examples to me that makes me believe that these are visitations. Rochelle, do you have maybe another story, of, or is there anyone that... um, got maybe a something surprising in their visitation, maybe something that they didn't know beforehand. And uh, do you know what Are I'm asking? There? Say it again. Hello, Sandra. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, something happened to the phone here. Just a second. Okay. Yeah, I think we're back on. Um, well, I think I'm just I'm answering you. They are... Most, I mean, they're all surprised because when they come, Mm -hmm. they don't expect what they get. And that's what I'll say to them at the end, you know, if they say, you know, is this something? Did I really get this? Do you think that this is something maybe I made up or um, it's a, they don't use the word mental construct, but that's what they're referring Mm -hmm. to. Um. And I'll say, well, did you expect to get this when you came today? And uh, I'll say, oh, no, I didn't, you know. Um, so, you know, that they they all do. I know, uh, well, I'm thinking of one person, uh, um, there are just so many, but, uh, and she's not in my book, but she came from uh, another state, and she said to me, 
when she called me, can you help me just get this picture out of my mind of my mother when she died? And she just sat up in the hospital bed and had this terrible grimace on her face. It was so awful. And, uh, well, the kind of work that I do for 15 years, a lot of EMDR, I knew that that, that we could do. That wasn't an issue. So I, I said, well, I think I can help you with that. And so she came, and she was not expecting anything. And it was amazing, Sandra, because when we started the processing, and I have a whole protocol that I do. They come for one day. For uh-huh. like five and a half hours. Okay. They come in, they spend the day, we take a half hour for lunch. There's something I do in the morning, and then in the afternoon we do the processing. And um, so as soon as we got to the processing, her mother came up immediately. And then her deceased father came up. And her brother, uh, just this, I mean, seven people came up, her her, this was a surprise <laughs> to me. Uh, then her uh, brother, who had died of an overdose of drugs, he came up, and um, an aunt and an uncle. There were seven. Wow. And yes, and then she she saw where they were living. She saw where they were at. I mean, it was just amazing, and. Um, what was interesting, all she wanted to do was get that picture of that that stuck in her mind, mm-hmm. uh, out of her mind, you know, and she didn't expect to get all that, and she was just elated. Wow. I, I, I found it really fascinating, um, but everyone is different, and it's... Um, you know, it's what the person is supposed to get. Sure, sure. Um, so, um, what question did I just have? I think, uh, oh yeah, did, are people talking out loud having this conversation with their loved one that you're hearing, well, or is it private? Well, I don't head? hear. No, I I write down um, what they're what they're saying. Um, they're not having it out loud. No. They're having it, it's it's between them and person on the other side. So they may get it, um, they may actually see the person, the person may actually hug them or kiss them. Mm. Or, I mean, this is kind of the, you know, what some of them have happened, but I wouldn't say it happens to all of them. So I don't want to mislead anyone, but they... Um, you know, one lady was able to stroke her daughter's hair and uh, see her in her little shorts or flip-flops the way she was on this side. And uh, so, and they take them many times somewhere. You know, they'll take them. In this particular case, they took she, her daughter took her down this long walkway with ivy coming down the side, and it was a brick walkway. And... Um, you know, she said a lot of things to her. And she was killed in an auto accident, the daughter, um, unexpectedly. And so it was a real shock to the mom. Of and course. She came from, yes, yeah, she came from way, I mean, far away. I'm in Washington State. She came from New York or somewhere pretty far away. And uh, she she didn't expect to get all of that and she felt so relieved in the end and actually her daughter you know because when when a child gets or or someone is in an accident you think oh they went through so much pain Mm -hmm. it's terrible and but no what they're getting is that they just um she saw her daughter just kind of she she they take a lot of times they'll take them back to the accident scene and they did her daughter did that, and it showed that she just kind of raised up from the wreckage and floating and wasn't hurt. I mean, she didn't feel anything. Oh, that's good news. 
That is, I mean, this is the, this is one of the things that I have really observed is that what we think when somebody's going through so much, something is taking them up and out of it, Sandra. Does that so include that, suffering? Like I saw my dad suffer tremendously and he was so drugged up to ease the pain or help. But I, I mean, he was suffering. Is Well, I... I, I'm, let me think about it just a moment. Mm-hmm. I think, I, this is what I think about that. I think a lot of that time they're spent on the other side. I think they've kind of partially left their body already mm-hmm. and they're, they're um, spending maybe more time on the other side than they are here. Even though their physical body is here and they're being given all these drugs and everything, I think that that's what they're doing. Yeah, I would. I go along with that. Uh, I've a, I ask that question a lot, hoping for the the same response. I've met some really incredible mediums, and a message coming through many times from my father was that even though we watched him suffer, he had already left his body, and so, he, there's no memory mm-hmm. of the pain. For him. Yeah, so that's what we were just talking about, weren't we? Yeah. I think that's really good news for us oh, here on Earth. Yes. Year. Because we're like, oh my, you know, when we're so, we're in such grief about what happened. And it's, um, it's really different. Yeah. I never. And we see it. I never um, understood my grandmother's prayer because my Grammy would always say, uh, when God calls you forth, you can't come fifth. That was her. <laughs> that was her little <laughs> slogan, which is very cute. But she just kept praying that there's no pain, no suffering. And mm-hmm. I mean, like a heavy duty. I heard her say that so many times. You know, God can take me, but just no suffering. And I, I thought, oh, okay, you know. And then it wasn't until I saw my dad pass that I got exactly what she means. And I think it's comforting for anybody who, if you're, if you're listening right now and you're ill, or I mean, we've got all kinds of listeners experiencing grief. But just knowing that you, you know n- nobody wants to pass from a disease and have pain. But if there is that possibility that our soul departs and and we're not present to the pain, oh, that's good news. It really, it really is good news. And um, another one that I did uh, a long time ago, and she's not, she's not in the book either, but she was from another country, and actually she was a therapist, and um, she targeted um, a fellow therapist that she had kind of a, her mentor for, she had known him for 20 years, and he passed at 61 from a heart attack. And it was such a shock to her. They yes. were just really good friends. And um, But when she, I worked with her, uh, and she did him, he had so much to say. I mean, he actually, um, he said of things that were coming and how they were coming in the future, and that he had said, you know, so many times he they had talked about um, the earth and how we're not taking care of it and things like that. And he said, remember, we talked about that when I was there. And then before he left, he changed his, his email uh, to Blue Yonder. That was before he actually knew he was going, he was sick. Mm-hmm. He changed it to Blue Yonder, which kind of, you know, is a hint. But um, anyway, she got a, she, you know, she got a lot from him, and he said, um, you know, you need to remember when you're on the treadmill or when people are on the treadmill, there is a stop button. Push the stop button. You can get off of it. And he said things, you know, things like that to her, and um, he said, get with people that are like-minded and Mm -hmm. be a light in this world, because when you are, it lights and helps other people, and your energy uh, spreads out in the world. He just had so much to say, and he also sent, the the thing that was interesting, Sandra, he sounded 
just, you know, just like a psychotherapist. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's what he spoke from the other oh, side. Yeah. And, Rochelle, this <laughs> so, might be a dumb question, but if they're not talking out loud, do you do they just tell you after the fact what happens or every so often well, do they come up for air and say, Oh, he just said this, he just said that? Yeah. Well, what happens is they have the headset going, which is right in their brain and um and so it's that's going, and then I'm using some eye movements and having them focus on, you know, focus on a particular uh, thing, and then have them go inside and see where it goes, mm-hmm. see where it goes. And then I tell them that you can either, um, either open your eyes when you get something and tell me what you're getting, or if I think you've gone too long... Then I'll have you take a deep breath, open your eyes, and tell me what you've been getting. Ah. And that's what that's how we go back and forth. It's almost like this wonderful energy Tai Chi that we go back and forth. <laughs> the oh. client and the therapist. I love it. And then now you have trained many therapists around well, actually around the world. I know there's more to come, but I just looking at your website. Uh, there's lots of folks out there, so people there don't are. have to. I mean, if they're near you, you still take clients, but there are people yes. around the world. Exactly, and so in the beginning, you know, I saw people were coming here a lot more. They were coming from all over. I of mean, course, <laughs> you know, flying here, and uh, <laughs> but now uh, there's not so many from out of the area um and there's more uh, around here that will come because they they can go to someone closer to them and that that makes it that what that's the whole idea to have at least a therapist in every state but we have people now in, in Mexico and South America and Canada quite a few in Canada and um Europe yes um Yes, we have um, one in the UK that um, I know of, and um, trying to think where else less in Europe right now. Um, right now, <laughs> yes, yes. And the thing is, you know, I do this in Gig Harbor, Washington. So, you know, it's they have to come here, and uh, it's really a nice place to come. Sure, and. But anyway, uh, I will be doing a training in Scottsdale at the end of the symposium. So people that are going to the um, therapists that are going to the symposium, if they choose to, they can stay and take the two-day training. Oh, that sounds great. And let's just have a little commercial for the symposium. You and I are both speakers at the Afterlife Research and Education Symposium, which is in Scottsdale, Arizona, September 15th through 17th. It is a big deal about cutting edge information in the world of the afterlife, communication with those dearly departed, and uh, also preparing for end of life. Very powerful, very real, all credible people like Rochelle Wright uh, that will be there. So I'm excited that you will have this two-day um, workshop after. Now, I'm. are these four therapists though i'm guessing these are for licensed therapists who okay. practice in this you know practice in or going to be doing this in the state they practice so it's for licensed um yes okay. they have to be licensed because you know it just they do have to know what to do and they have to know if it goes somewhere they need to be able to go there and work with it so you do have to have that background yeah and i get it too because right now i'm not in the throes of grief but i have been uh losing Mm -hmm. my grandmother and my father which is a very close relationship and i know there's people listening right now who've lost a child or uh, a a loved one or i mean there's there's so many ways grief rears its ugly head and it can be i mean for me rochelle it was the deepest darkest time of my life so i would have no problem trusting a trained therapist over uh you know some guy that just has a shingle out so i i have no problem uh, that you're you're training therapists Mm -hmm. i think that's very important but what is your book about now because anybody can 
get your book. Mm -hmm. And it sounds to me like you have some stories. Yes. Oh, yes. Tell us about the book. Very exciting stories in there, actually. They, um, I started writing it when all this started happening. Well, um, and so there's 26 stories of people that I saw, uh, and what happened, you know, what, what came up. And I'm just, I've got the book right here. And, um, uh, yeah, this, I'll just read you just a little bit about okay. what, what the main point and what they got. The one, this one, um, she was a regular client of mine and her husband was killed in an auto accident late at night. And, um, finally she decided to do this with me. And what she got was, I will be there for you, but only in a different way. Hmm. And the other lady I spoke about whose daughter was in the auto accident um, came from New York. Her, what I have for her is, um, in the book it says, um, it was her, I know it was her. So that kind of answers some questions too. I think you had a, how do they know or what? She, yes. It was her, I know it was her. And she hugged her and kissed her and was able to stroke her long hair. That's beautiful. That's the one. And uh, this other one who did her father, um, she I, she was a regular client for quite some time. And um, we did a session, and then she came back the next week, and she'd had a dream. And so I said, you know, has anything come up? And she said, well, I well, I had this dream, but it was nothing. And I said, well, tell me about the dream. So she did, and I said, well, okay, close your eyes. Let's just try something. Close your eyes. Go back inside. And, you know, just bring up your dad, uh, how it was in the dream. So I set the scene of the dream that she told me about. And uh, all of a sudden, he just started talking to her and helping her, and he... Uh, so her line in here, just in the contents, table of contents, is, Dad's teaching me right now about what I am doing as an adult. And he actually told her uh, she was in her 60s. He said, um, the reason you've been picking the men you have is because they were like me. They wow. were unavailable. Wow. They were unavailable for you. Oh, it's it's. They get so much stuff, it gives me chills now to think about it, because I get to be right in there with it, Sandra. Oh, yeah, and, and I, Rochelle, I think of times that I've, like I said in the beginning, gone on a little hypnotic journey, and of course I could picture somebody sitting in a park bench next to me, and it feels very real, but I've never been able to jump up and hug somebody, to some, touch someone's hair, had communication coming from them. So, I mean, it, this is clear to me, and I know it is too, to the, your clients, that this is the real deal. These people are really coming yeah. through. Well, it, it is, it's, and it's, it's very exciting. Um, this one, I'm, I'm going to uh, tell you, I did this, um, I did this therapist in the beginning, and he just he said, "Well, I never, I don't have any uh, issues with my mom. I'm not sad about her passing. You know, I'm fine with everything." And but I said, "Well, I want to practice on you." Mm-hmm. <laughs> so he came over, and uh, and what he he said he really didn't expect to get much because they didn't have any kind of a difficult relationship. But what he got from her was amazing. She said to him. What's hard for you to understand, Gary, is there is there isn't a separation between life and death. And he said, that is what she said to me. What's hard for me to understand is that there isn't a separation between life and death. Yes. Wow. It's kind of, that was, I mean, he's like really taken back by it. Sure. And I, yes. And um, another person I see, um, these are all in the beginning, Sandra. This is in 2010. <laughs> oh We're talking about gosh. seven years ago. Wow. <laughs> well, this, uh, this was a regular, see, these were regular clients of mine, a lot of them in the beginning. And uh, this was a regular client of mine. She must have been around 38 years old. And her grandmother um, 
on Mother's Day, they were going to her house uh, with her mother and an aunt and several ladies to take the grandma out for Mother's Day lunch. And what happened is they got to the scene and there was crime tape all around. And the grandma was missing and was missing for a month. And they found her later about, I'm not sure how much longer, but they found her, um, well, at, at a, I don't know, in a field, in an air base somewhere, you know. Uh, and they found her body. Wow. And they said that, yeah, or they found the remains of her or something. So she did her, and she is in the book, and I was just like amazed, because it's the first, one of the first ones I did, you know? And um, I I said it's going to be like five hours, well, or four, <laughs> five. Well, it went on, and the grandma went on and on and on, and the bottom line is she said, love yourself with a vengeance. Do not live your life in fear. I will always be be behind the light and with you. And she gave her so much information how to live her life now. Um, so there's just, uh, it's amazing. And she also said um, that she she knew where she was going. She said, um, I wasn't afraid when I was in the back, locked in the back of the trunk of a car, I knew, uh, and it just, it was, it was so amazing, Sandra. So I don't really do those kind very much. Right. I don't encourage it, but, um, I was, it was, it was really, uh, something. She said, um, uh, she said, she told her something like, um, there are two things you need to understand. One, I am a metaphor for your life. The big black hole and the trunk of the car that I was in, I said, for me? But Grandma just continued. That's how you have been living your life. The black hole was too late for me. It's not too late for you. You need to get out of it. And then Grandma said, two, love yourself with a vengeance. Do not live your life in fear. I will always be behind the light. And she... um, Let's see, she said, the light is on your, okay, she said, release the fear, it's the pain and anxiety. It's time. It's time to release your fear, your pain, and your anxiety. Release it. We are all behind the light. The light is on your path. All you need to do is follow it. We are here with you by your side as you go down your path. We can't do it for you, but you will do it. It's all about getting out of the black hole that you are in and letting go of the past. Fear will not dictate your anxiety. Your passions will. Live passionately. Be happy. That is the definition of success. Fear not. I will always be behind the light. That's Um, great. But she went on and on and on and helped her, you know, um, I mean, and so that day, I was, you know, this is when I first started doing it, mm-hmm. and I was just like, we both were getting tired after, it must have been five hours, and I said, well, ask her, is it okay if we stop and come back tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> That's the only one, only one I've ever done that with Sandra, and she said, you know, yes, but you be back here tomorrow, because I have a lot more to say to you. It's incredible. Time's going by fast in our interview here, so I just a couple more questions. Um, there's Craig says there's ninety eight percent success rate with this. Yes, um, there is. As long as they're follow, the therapists are following the protocol right. and doing it like I I train them to do it. Yes, and that's that's about um, that's about what I have. You know, um, so it's it's. It is it is amazing uh, that it is. And um, do I have a moment to yeah, keep, uh, you have, give you an email? <laughs> sure. We have we have okay. at least ten minutes left, but I just oh, okay. wanted to make sure we you know hit on 
we'll just keep talking. Go ahead. I, I'm loving yes. listening to you. Loving, yes. loving, they loving. Are, they, do get, they do get the connections. And, you know, it's not me. That's what's really wonderful. I mean, I'm just a tool, a conduit uh, in this whole process. So um, I actually tell myself, I, you know, I don't know, I have to worry about what to say or to do mm-hmm. because he who sent me will direct me. I mean, that's directly from The Course in Miracles. But I say that a lot of times and, um, you know, kind of to myself. So I'm never anxious about what they're going to get because it's not me. Right. That's, that's the exciting part for me. <laughs> and that you can teach people this protocol is fantastic. I can. Oh, I love it. uh, What's the email? Pardon? What's the email? You said, do you have time to read an email? Oh, yes, yes. I got an email. This was in March. This um, psychologist came from Salem, Oregon. She'd lost her husband, who was also a psychologist, and he taught philosophy at the university down there and so forth. And uh, But he had... um, he had just been passed for six months. They, you know, we used to wait in the beginning for a year, but I've done some, as long as the person on this side is uh, stable and, um, you know, I can go ahead and do it. I did, I did one where they were only gone for eight weeks. Wow. And another for three months. It just depends. And when I spoke with Craig Hogan, he said, Rochelle, as... The other side always would like to communicate, but it's this side, you know, that stops it. So they have to be ready on this side. Yes. And so I have to screen them well for that if they're going to do it this soon. But this was in six months, and she said um, she actually was a psychologist herself, and she said, um, Hello, Rochelle. I've been wanting to update you since our session but I was waiting to see how well it held. <laughs> hmm. The day after, I, day after, I truly felt like someone had reorganized me, and I was lighter, more free, more settled, and happier. That lasted for quite a while. I started getting busier as the old me would be and want to do, and I found I got tired and I'm not ready for that. I need, I still need quiet, solitude, lack of schedule, and some space. The traumas that I had regarding my husband are cleared. The, uh, the beautiful experience I had with him is still holding. I can bring it up, I can feel him, and I feel so much better when I remember and when I tell others about it. And then uh, she said, um, Rochelle, your method is really very amazing and so significant and beneficial. I'm so grateful you were willing to work with me at this time. It was worth every penny to have that tender time with my husband, wow. hear his messages, and feel his close presence. I think all the components are necessary and love that the therapist is not in charge. Um the loved one is, and of course I would add spirit is, or a higher intelligence, or God, whatever the word is people use. Yes. So she said, all makes perfect sense to me. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And um, I believe she also said, I am thinking, uh, oh, she said uh, before this, right now, the October training looks like the right time. Oh. It certainly is a good fit for me and vice versa. It's really great. It it transforms yes. people's lives. Well, it does. And um and there's you know, I've seen so much from the other side doing this work. That's just it's um very exciting and um uh, wow. Has anyone you know, done have- it on you? Yes, um, I had a therapist that I trained who lives about an hour from here and wanted to, and she came over and um, worked with me. And um, actually, a couple of them have. I let them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and I did um, I did do the work with her, and it was with um, my 
ex-deceased husband who had cancer, uh-huh. who died about 20 years ago, um, who had came to me prior to that and said, you know, what I told you in the beginning of our of our conversation yes. today. And, uh, and it really helped. It took me to a lot of places, and it just, it cleared up a lot of things. That was very good. And another time, um, my aunt, I was so worried about her because, worried how I treated her, because years ago she came to um, where I was working, and she said, oh, and she came from like three hours away, and she was with my mom. And I said, oh, we've come in to take you to lunch. We want to see you. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm just too busy. I can't do it right now. And I've always regretted that because she passed away. And um, it seemed so happy. She was so happy to see me. And I thought, you know, why? Why didn't I stop and just go with them? That was so I, I targeted that. And she came across and she's like saying, oh, I didn't even notice it. I never even thought about that. It didn't matter. Oh. And it relieved me so sure. much. Sure. And I haven't thought about it really since. So, oh. uh, I know with me, my grandmother, um, the, the day she passed away, it was unexpected. And I was traveling, and I had actually thought that, oh, I should call Grammy today. And then I said, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. Well, there was no tomorrow, and I was I lived with that, that guilt for a long, long time. Right. Uh, and uh, even another one, my dad's best friend called him um, while he, my dad was lying there, uh, days before he passed, and his friend said, can you just put the phone up to your dad's ear? I just want to say goodbye to my best friend, right? So I don't know mm-hmm. what was said, but I held it there, I held it there, and then it was after dad passed that I realized the ear I held it up to was his deaf ear. Oh. Oh, t- I mean, that chokes me up now, but knowing oh, yeah. that, you know, I had that guilt, and so part of my journey into the discovering the afterlife uh, and I think it even actually came through a medium is that dad got the message from his best friend you know and I thought Uh hallelujah I mean these things are important it's important because we can we can hang on to that guilt Uh, oh yes and think you know it's it's our fault or why are we you know yeah and it 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 uh, it doesn't help us because no. what they do, it's different for them, you know. Yeah. Just like, um, just like my aunt said, um, you know, I, it, I, I never even thought about it. I've been thinking about it ever since it happened, you know. So, and it gave me so much relief. Of and, course. Um, I, I know we're just about out of time. I will tell you one other thing that okay. I would like to say. You know, they also come to us in that twilight zone between going to sleep and not quite asleep mm-hmm. and also just waking up and not quite woke up. Um, I had it happen to me uh, about three years ago. Um, my brothers, um, he had one child, one daughter, and no one knew this was going to happen. She'd worked um well, in the hospital, she was a nurse, and uh, she had a really excellent job at uh, actually at Cancer Care Alliance, and uh, worked there 28 years. And she took her life. Yeah. That was just a shock for my brother and really all of us, because no one was expecting it, and she never gave any clue. So, but what happened is a day or two later. Just as I was, I'm thinking, was I waking up? No, just as I was falling asleep, I saw her, um, like uh, the sound of music, Mm -hmm. Julie Andrews, and she was just dancing over this high field, and she had kind of this dress on, like Julie Andrews, and she was singing, and then she had this chuckle, and she was chuckling, chuckling, and you know, you couldn't repeat that chuckle if you wanted to. <laughs> I mean, she had that chuckle. And I meant, you know, I told my brother about it, too. He says, yes, she had that chuckle. And I can't bring it up now. But uh, So that's really interesting, too. They come to us during that time. 
That's great. I noticed on your website that you offer a free meditation that people can just click on and download and listen. Yes. That's 45 minutes. Um, could you explain what that is? Because I know not all of us are going to make the trip and, and spend five hours with a, a therapist. I know many people will, I, if this had been available uh, after my dad passed and in that year after, if I'd known about it, I would have flown to Washington. No doubt about it. But is there something mm-hmm. within your, or maybe just describe your meditation and if it could, could well, do yes, something they for can us. Well, da- yes, they can listen to it or, or they can download it. And um, the meditation is um, is very relaxing and it is uh, a, an attempt that if it is supposed to happen, that they would might be able to connect with their loved one. It's, it at least sets that uh, energy and seeing for them. So that's what it's about. It doesn't mean that they're going to connect, but um, I, I I did this um, at an afterlife conference, and that's what uh, got it started. I did that, and one lady that was there who had never been able to connect with her son connected during the meditation. And she was saying, oh, is there any way, you know, that you you can do this? And so that's why I went ahead and did it and put it on my site. Oh, she was really elated because fantastic. she had seen, yeah, she would seen a lot of people trying to connect with him, mm-hmm. a lot of well-known people. And she hadn't. And so just during this meditation, but... I don't want to also give people false hope that that's what's going to happen when they listen to it, but it's uh, that's what happened to her. Yeah, and I want to say, too, I just took a course um, on mediumship and trance mediumship and quieting the mind, and, you know, I have a, I have a strong sense, and this is just me, you can... I don't think you're going to argue with me, but the way our human minds are, especially in 2017, they're very busy, and it's very hard to still the mind. And I have the instinct that if someone doesn't get results with your meditation that it's something to not give up on and the more you may listen to it and the more you may practice uh you know uh, and i haven't listened to it honestly but the the more times you may develop that place you need to be for that um communication to come through and like you said there's no guarantees but i have the feeling that it's you know if it you don't no success on the first time you keep trying would that be something that someone could do yes and it would actually help them to become more relaxed and like you say in this very busy world it's as if the world has speeded up and we're all expected to move faster and faster and that's what i i think it's it's what we really need to do is stop. Like I got from the therapist who passed, there is a button on the treadmill we can push, the stop button, and we can get off of it. And I think it gives them that time to get off of that busyness and to get more centered. Because that's what, you know, that's what we need to do. That's yeah. why I think people come in dreams because we're more quiet and that's when they can come. Because when we're so busy, we're, you know, we're too busy. Mm -hmm. They do show up and give us signs when we're going about our day, of course. But, um, so, you know, that would help them just at the very minimum to become relaxed and um, to just feel better. After yes. 45 minutes to feel better. Of course. I, I'm sure I'm, I'm going to listen to that later on today, in fact. And I'm, I'm really grateful that you give that. And again, Rochelle's website is rochellewright.com, or you can easily go to we don't die radio dot com and click on this episode with Rochelle Wright and I'll have uh, I have a link to her website there as well. You have any closing words, Rochelle? Our thoughts. Well, I do. I no. I just. Um, well, I would just stay, uh, say, stay open, and things come to us in many different ways. But we're so busy, we don't pay attention. But they come in signs. They come in what people might say. They come in music. Uh, you feel a presence. 
uh, you might uh, see 1111 mm-hmm. <laughs> on the clock. You might find a, a shiny penny, which is just, you need to really pay attention to that. And the other thing I'd like to say is this has been a wonderful to be able to talk to you, Sandra, without interruptions. We've been able to just talk, and it's wonderful. Thank I you. I so appreciate it. Thank you. It's one of these things where it's my show. I can do whatever I want. You know, we don't need to take commercial breaks. And your words are important. They really are. And, well, thank you. And I'm excited about reading the book, too, uh, Repair and Reattachment Grief Therapy. And it is still being sold on Amazon, I saw, as ga- Guided Afterlife yes. Connections. So don't feel, you who's listening, that you need to get them both. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No problem right. at all. Oh, Rochelle, right. I appreciate you beyond belief for everything that uh, you, you're you doing and even being coaxed by Craig to write the book and uh, speak at the symposium and to make it as available as you have. Mm-hmm. Well, I will so look forward to seeing you at the symposium. Oh, I'm so excited about that. And for our listener, I, you know, you might feel that I'm pushing the symposium on you, and maybe I am, but it's going to be... Like nothing else that's ever happened before, uh, the symposium, September 15th through 17th. And also, if you are a therapist, and this sounds like something that you'd be interested in learning, uh, the repair and reattachment grief therapy, you're welcome to come and learn. And I'm sure, I, I know Rochelle's email address is on her website, but to find out more. There are mm-hmm. so many people suffering from grief, and it's, it is, to me, the, the worst pain that I've ever felt emotionally in my entire life. And if we can help another human being through it and give them hope and, and to know that your loved one is not gone, they're just in an invisible space and they can still talk to you, that'd be a huge gift you'd have for your clients. So in closing, I want to say my name's Sandra Champlain, and I'm d- delighted to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. And like Rochelle said earlier, one of the messages that came through, love yourself with a vengeance. I love that. Live happily, live passionately, and know that your loved ones will always be behind the light. So I want to thank you for listening, and we'll see you soon. Mm-hmm.